Hello and welcome. I'm Martin Goodman. I'm the publisher of Barbican Press, and it's really great to have you all coming from all over the globe, I think, into our virtual living room. And it's a, a huge privilege for me today to be having this chance to introduce a wonderful new novel called The Silk Pavilion by a brilliant, uh, a brilliant novelist. This is her third novel, the second one published by us. We published the first one way back um, called Rufius, which is uh, an astonishingly different love story set in the fourth century. Um, fourth, fourth century. And uh, I go for that, but then also you know, do try out this. Um, I, I met Sarah way back in um, 2007 in Brighton when I just in, when I just um, brought out a book about mentoring creative writing. We met in Brighton, and um, Sarah said to me, "Could we maybe um, could I maybe be mentored by you?" I said, "Sorry, I've just taken a job lecturing at Plymouth. Can I upgrade you to a PhD?" And she was very game and able and said yes. So we started off at Plymouth in 2009 when Barbican Press actually was first brought together as being a company. Uh, Barbican Press being um, the, the idea of a company as a Barbican, a, a solid place that holds people that are blazingly different writers that, that, that um, need this safe space to carry their, their very brave and daring books out into the world. One of the things that I do as, um, sometimes is thinking, wow, would it be nice to have known George Herbert or Virginia Woolf or Daphne du Maurier? No, if I'd been around at that time. And then I think, hold on a minute, I'm around at this time. Who are these people? Obviously, it takes you know, the decades to, uh, to forge a reputation. But for me, Sarah Walton is one of these stellar writers who dares an enormous amount in her fiction. She actually sort of scares herself sometimes in where she goes and then controls it. So she takes us into new areas, new areas of the psyche, new areas of imagination, new areas of daring, and new areas of the globe. I didn't know Dea, this, this, this little town of Mallorca, until I came across it in Sarah's book. And now I feel I know it really well. I'm going to let Sarah um, tell you more about her book, and I'm going to let um, um, Ed, um, Ed Hurst be the person that asked about her. Ten years ago now, um, Ed wandered into a room in Hull University where I was presenting the first um, um, book from the literary side of Barbican Press, a book called Writing Hull, which was written by people on the MA course in, in Hull, one of my other roles as being emeritus professor of creative writing at the University of Hull. And um, Ed, from being in there 10, you know, 10 years ago, stayed on to do his MA, stayed on to do his PhD, and now he is a real stellar force within the creative writing community at Hull, who leads a course in fantasy, science fiction and horror writing, and um, runs his own PhD students, and we're very privileged to be publishing his debut novel from Barbican Press, Mindbreaker, next year. He's also a brilliant guy and a wonderful interviewer, so I'm pleased to be able to pass you over into the warm, wonderful embrace of conversation and intelligence and literary know-how that is Ed and Sarah in conversation. Um, so as Martin mentioned, uh, the structure of this event, we can have about 30 to 40 minutes of uh, Sarah and I chatting about the novel um, and then and having some readings um, from the novel as well. And then for the last sort of 20 or so minutes, we'll be inviting questions from the audience. The last thing to mention is uh, it's just a, a few content warnings uh, for the discussion today. So given the content of the book and the content of our discussion, there may be discussion of abuse, of sex and of trauma. Just to let you all know uh, before we begin. Um, so, six years ago, I interviewed uh, Sarah Walton for the very first time um, at the launch of her debut novel, uh, Rufius. I was a, a fresh-faced PhD student suddenly sat in front of, of a debut author in a very plush chair. I don't think I've sat in one quite like it since. Um, desperately stammering my way through questions about blowjobs because I thought that's what an interviewer should do uh, when you interview someone who, who's written a novel like Rufius. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here once again, six years later, uh, to interview Sarah about her third novel. Uh, I think that's plenty of me talking for now. So, Sarah, I may pass over to you now and ask you if you wouldn't mind to perhaps introduce yourself and uh, the Silk Pavilion uh, to everyone watching today. Thank you Ed and great to be in an interview with you again. Um, I'm now a bit nervous about the questions I might have. Um, thank you to Barbican Press, thank you to Martin for believing in the book, another book, um, not a book inspired by an obscure Latin insult this time, a book inspired by a night 
in a very seemingly haunted house because of the uh, imagination that I have in Dea in Mallorca. Um, so I'm Sarah Walton. Um, I'm a novelist. I also am a digital advisor to governments and to large businesses. I set up a dot com in 1994. I went to Silicon Valley and it went bust. So I'm not a dot com billionaire or I'd be reading other people's books lying on a beach. Um, but this book is a book you can read, The Silk Pavilion, Lying on a Beach. Um, it is uh, not the easiest read in the world. And uh, I've been having fun and also um, some challenging moments reading the bloggers and reviewers um, reviews that have been coming in thick and fast and all very positive four and five star reviews which is uh, really so uplifting considering we how long this book took me to write it was six years in the writing and um, I'm so glad that it's found a home with Barbican Press again. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I suppose this feels quite uh, quite general uh, for, a, for a first question, but I think it will be a really useful one to, for us to perhaps begin with. I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about your inspiration for the book. You know, where did the idea come from? Where did you find your characters? And perhaps particularly the place and the setting of the narrative. Obviously, having read it myself, it feels very, a very important element here is not just the who and the and the what, but also the where. Um, so I wondered if you could perhaps speak a little bit to that sense of inspiration for this. Sure. Um, well, the very first chapter that I wrote, the chapters are named. And I would say that was by accident because I'm not into named chapters except for children's books. Um, but I needed to find my way around the novel and I was dipping in and out of writing it and doing other things at the same time. So it was an orientation function for me. But I've kept the naming of the chapters in here, partly because Mar um, Martin and uh, also Dee Dee um, liked the idea. They, they enjoyed it. Um, so I'm, oh, Julie from Eat, Bake and Sing is, is full screen. Hi, Julie, lovely to see you. Um, so the, 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 the inspiration came one night in, in a house in Dea. And this house, I'd gone to finish my previous book, Rufius, and it happened to be across the valley to Robert Gray's house, who penned I, Claudius. So this is a wonderful synchronicity to me. Anyway, in this particular night, um, this is the night that the first chapter got written the following day called Plumbing. Um, the plumbing in this house was horrendous and there were these clanks on the pipes all the time. And in the, this particular evening, there was a storm that blew up and there's a, a terrible wind um, that blows through this island of Mallorca sometimes. And the Sirocco blew up in from the Sahara Desert. And with it came the most horrendous um, gale and the noises that were screaming through this house were absolutely terrifying. And I was there on my own and there was a knock at the door. And so I imagined it was a serial killer, obviously, as you do. Um, it wasn't a serial killer, it was just the neighbour. But the neighbour features in the novel as a looming uh, character in the novel. And that one of the things that I began to um, uncover during my period in Dea was uh, the Spanish, the, the atrocities that had occurred on the island um, as a result of the Spanish Civil War. And I went and swam in the Cala at Dea. And Dea um, is a place where a lot of um, men were either forced to jump or thrown off of the Miriador. So this viewpoint very high up on these cliffs. And the women would go with baskets the following morning and pick up their remains and try to bury what was left of them. And uh, the rest of them the sea took. So, I had this uh, moment of realizing that I was swimming above a graveyard um, and walking through these beautiful olive groves through a graveyard. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time in Spain because I'd been there as a child. I had been taken to Franco, General Franco's uh, memorial outside of Madrid when I was 14 years of age. And so I'd first been introduced to Franco then um, by some friends of mine who were Spanish. And I went to Barcelona University and studied um, Catalan and Castilian Spanish. Um, so I, I was steeped in Spanish culture and I understood that 
this rift that um, had existed for a long, long time was still there in the language between Catalan and Castilian um, uh, Spanish speakers. And I think um, when I was in Barcelona, when I was in Barcelona, there were bombs going off. So I, was, I did a lot of research into the language. There's bits and pieces of Catalan and Mallorquin, which is part of the um, is a dialect of Catalan, um, as well as Spanish, little bits and pieces in the book. Um, and, and what I realized when I was in this house this night um, was that my imagination had gone crazy and I started wondering, is it haunted? And I started also thinking about the trauma of my childhood and relationships that I got locked into um, because of the trauma of my childhood. And the way in which my imagination worked when confronted with fear. Um, and this then took me off into um, a deep dive into my own past and reflecting on my own journey through therapy to uncover my childhood trauma and what had driven me to make certain choices about certain men and what had then locked me into relationship with one very dangerous man um, and what was uncovered uh, through therapy was that this was rooted in my childhood trauma which I found quite extraordinary so these are bits and pieces we have a haunted house and the haunted house made me think what was wrong with Mrs De Winter in Rebecca and what would have happened if Mrs De Winter went into therapy and so I thought well I'm going to write a novel that has a haunted maybe it's a haunted house in it um we're never quite sure are we with mandalay um i'm going to write an, an, a modern version of, of this type of house book where there's a this character that's searching for home who's lost who's searching for identity and who's locked in a dangerous love affair in a house that completely seduces her the way mandalay seduced mrs de winter um and i'm also going to create a character that's perhaps a little bit different to our Mandalay character. So I was thinking more of, along the lines of Ripley and Highsmith. And because I was in fear of the serial killer that wasn't at the front door, I thought that I'd create some intrigue with, is there or isn't there a serial killer in Dea? Or is this a figment of the traumatized landscape of the psyche of this woman um, in the novel of Lucy? Um, so what I ended up doing was entwining all these elements and I became very interested in during the writing of the novel of the link between personal trauma and national trauma. So whereas Lucy um, buries and uh, the stories of her childhood, we have the nation of Spain with all of the trauma buried beneath the soil. So I'm looking at the shadow, the shadow of a nation and the shadow of an individual and how that pitches up generations later to influence um, a modern woman and a modern man in a relationship and how they're driven by the unconscious trauma. That's a very long answer, Ed. No, that's excellent. As I say, I'm quite literally bursting with questions to sort of follow up from that, but you've given such an excellent sort of overview as to sort of what the book's about. I wonder if this would be an, an excellent time for our first reading. Um, for perhaps for, you know, for people to start getting a hint of what the book sounds like and, and how the book perhaps introduces itself, having heard your excellent introduction for it. Um, so I wonder if, you, if you'd like to give us that first reading. Uh, I certainly would. And um, thanks for the trigger warnings, as there, there needs to be them in uh, an environment like this. Um, I don't add them in the novel because uh, I think it takes away from some of the catharsis. Um, but uh there is a uh, childhood abuse in, in, in this novel. So this is the prologue and the setting is a bed set, North London. Last night I dreamt I went to Villa Rosa again. The iron gates that led to the driveway and steep grass lawn to the house were closed to me. There was a padlock on the gate. He had not put that there. He would not have parted with the money, but made some half-baked thing himself. I called in my dream to him, Miguel, mi amor. Silence drowned the night. And the madronio tree was lit by a single moonbeam. That old disappointment returned. That lonely grief that defined our love from the beginning. 
Then, like all dreamers, I was possessed by supernatural powers and passed like a ghost through the iron gates. The driveway overgrown, the lawn high and unruly. His sculptures of gigantic phalli that had dotted the garden were gone. The two olive trees had grown so close together, their branches wrapped around each other like some deformed mythic hermaphrodite. The garden was overshadowed by the forest of the Tex. The mountain had invaded the garden, its menacing walls of trees that were bearable, beautiful even from a distance, had imprisoned the garden in a shroud of shadow. Nature had reclaimed what was always hers. I looked up at Villa Rosa's salmon pink walls, bruised with dirt and blistered with cancerous marks, like Miguel's sunspots, where the paint has flaked away, as if the house was covered with his skin. Miguel has gone. Alarm floods my dream body, and I run the rest of the way up to the front door. A rosebush thorn cuts my hand as my urgent fingers hunt for the key behind the plant pots. I open the door with the key and let myself inside. As only happens in dreams, time changes, location changes. I am my young self, sitting at the, stop, the top of the stairs of my family's North London semi-detached, looking at the front door, waiting waiting for my father to return from golf. The front door swings open, in he comes, my father. He takes a golf club from the antique golf bag and ornament in the lobby. The wildness is in his eyes. I run to my bedroom, pull the duvet over my head, curl into a fetus shape and brace myself. In he comes, barking like a dog. He beats the duvet with the golf club. When he's finished, in comes my mother and strokes me over the duvet. Daddy loves you, darling. I am sobbing, body arched and rigid in fetal protection, fingers clenched around the duvet so she cannot take it off me. Daddy loves you, darling. An ex excellent reading there, uh, Sarah. So the, the one negative of, you know, we're all being interconnected through the internet, which is fantastic, but you can't hear the applause that I'm certain would have sort of risen after after a reading like that. <laughs> um, it's excellent. I say, having having read the book myself, uh, that the prologue, it just hooks you straight away. It's so human and it's so evocative and it's so it's, it's so intriguing um, and yet sort of distressing at the same time. It's this heady mix to really sort of get you, you know, straight away going into the novel. Um, one of the, the things that I found uh, particularly uh, exciting for this particular interview about the novel is that in one of the first instances, um, our sort of protagonist, perhaps Lucy and uh, Miguel, are having an author interview. And uh, Lucy's asking Miguel questions about uh, his novels and his writing process. And I thought, well, this will be easy for me. I'm just going to steal those questions and I'm going to ask those to Sarah uh, instead. Um, so I think the first one, perhaps linking from what you were saying in when you were introducing the book, the first of, uh, of Lucy's questions I'm going to steal is um, how much of yourself would you say goes into this novel? And perhaps as a follow up for that, where do you sort of, where and how do you draw that boundary between the self and the character that then sort of emerges onto the pages? Thanks, Ed. When I wrote that line in the novel, I hoped that I would never be asked that question. So um, <laughs> I deserve it, don't I? So yeah, how much of myself goes into a novel? Well, I think it depends on the novel. Although I would say as a general, I would say that a writer puts themselves into every single character in their novel. So there's an element of me in Miguel, however unbearable the thought of that is that there must be. And there's an element of me in Lucy, which is very much more apparent to me. Um, and in the neighbor too. Um, there was an element of me in an ancient Roman character who now would be considered trans. Um, so, uh, and I'm not an ancient Roman effeminate male, um, a canidus. So um, I think, we if we as writers it's important to become our characters um i was teaching character last week on the ma in creative writing and i suggest to my students that they step into the skin of their their character on a physical level feel what it's like to move around in in their body physically through the senses um but then also how would it be to talk like them what's their voice like and how do they think and what's their world view um, so what I was attempting to do in this novel, and I did end up role playing Miguel in a speed dating scenario. So Miguel's this narcissistic, um, very narcissistic, self-centered, 
uh, quite dangerous character. Um, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but there are suggestions as we move through the novel that he could potentially be a murderer. I'm not going to let you know if he is or he isn't, because that's one of the intrigues of the novel. Um, and so uh, a friend of mine who was a stage director and was in a, write a writer's group I used to go to suggested, well, why don't you be Miguel? and speed date with some other people here with uh, who are in their characters too and it was really quite enlightening and as a result of that I decided that I was going to write Miguel in as a first person voice and there's only a few chapters of him uh, and it was a difficult a character to write um, but I think that Carl Jung is also mentioned in, in the novel, segments the psyche into 13 archetypes or 12 or 13 archetypes and so the, the mother the king, the archetypal murderer, you know, the baddie. So here we've got we've got the the baddie, and so I it was it's interesting to step into that character and walk around in their skin, and and I think there's something within all of us that can connect to his ruthlessness, um, although we may like him want to push that into the shadows, along with all the pain and the trauma that that has resulted in a character like that, because for sure. Abuse breeds abuse, and uh, there's abuse in in Miguel's background. Um, in terms of uh, my research for the novel, some of it did come from my own experience of childhood trauma. So this was a very difficult novel to write. Lucy's story is not my story, um, but I have drawn on my own experience in therapy sessions. Um, with my therapist whose permission I asked if I could fictionalize him and he was cool with that um, uh, have gone has gone into the novel um, so it was quite a raw novel to write and I think because I was very honest emotionally although in terms of the story this is fiction I really delved deep into the pain and the shame and those dark feelings of childhood abuse and tried to feed those into the voice of Lucy. So quite a lot of me emotionally went into this book. No, absolutely. And, you know, you can you can feel the, the emotional impact of the of the novel. You can very much feel that sort of that, that flickering but beneath and then back, right back above the surface. It's very emotion driven. And it's very it's got a very clear sense of the internal world in this novel. You're very aware of not just the character through their actions and their reactions, but through their thoughts and the way they perceive the world around them as well, uh, which I think is an excellent strength of the points of view you've used here. And I think that contrast between Lucy and Miguel's perspectives is, is an excellent, so it's almost an excellent study in that differentiation between the two characters and how they see perhaps very similar things very, very differently because they're adding their own perspective. Um, perhaps just a very, I saw a brief follow-up um, from that discussion then. Obviously, you mentioned that you've, sort of, you know, you've, you've, you've looked at your own um, childhood trauma and discussions with, with a therapist to, to get this novel sort of together. I suppose the question would be, how did you take care of yourself as you were doing that? How did you maintain that you were sort of protecting yourself as you were sort of you're mining for this material, I suppose, through your, your research? Um, I would say that... Um... I mean, by the time that I wrote this novel, I'd already been through therapy. Um, but I, I sent the draft of the book to my therapist because I wanted his, there's an, a Jungian and analytical approach at the core of it. And uh, I wanted his view on, on the psychology, uh, which he gave me the absolute thumbs up for. So that, that was good. Um, in terms of... Um, protecting oneself I mean I think I don't take that attitude Ed I never have I taken the attitude philosophically that I came into this life to know myself and uh, I wanted to be pushed in therapy to the places that hurt because I believe that we have the opportunity to heal through going into the pain not to wallow in it but to go there to relive what needs to be re-experienced, but in a safe environment, i.e. with a therapist and not with a dark narcissistic lover like Miguel. Um, and so I was, I think, quite brutal with myself in therapy. I didn't shy away from it. I'm not really a person who shies away from things. I take risks. And so I did so in therapy and I do so in my writing too. 
Oh, excellent. I think it's such an interesting approach to it. And obviously making sure that, you know, these, as you said, you give here to know yourself. So you, this is a, an, another technique, perhaps another way in which you can you can develop more of that understanding of, of the self. Um, let's perhaps um, sort of linger on that a little bit. This idea, you've mentioned sort of the Jungian um, analysis and things that, uh, that we've, we've sort of talked about already. And obviously something that's very key in this novel, not particularly frequent, but very, very key moments is the use of dreams um, throughout fiction. Of course, there, there are a lot of there are a lot of cliches about writing dreams in fiction. Let's let's say that much. Um, so I wondered if you perhaps give us a little insight into how you went about creating these sort of dream sequences and why perhaps you felt they were, you know, they are, they are very integral to the narrative, but how you sort of came to that conclusion when you were originally drafting it. Um, yeah, sure. Well, I had Martin's, uh, Martin was my mentor and also my PhD supervisor and then became my publisher for Rufius. And um I knew his view and take on dreams that it's one of the rules of fiction, just never put a dream in a novel. Uh, so my novel opens with a dream and then there are a series of dreams throughout the novel. So uh, I was very surprised when Martin liked the book. Um, some of the dreams have been cut. Thank you for your sharp editorial eye over at Barbican Press. Um, but the dreams weren't there to begin with. but. <clears throat> Uh, dreams are one of the places um, that analysis goes to to uncover that which is in the shadow. So the places that are hidden within the self from us. So Lu Lucy goes on a deep dive of exploration into her psyche to uncover why she's chosen to be with this abusive man and why she finds it so very difficult to leave him. And the conclusion that she comes to is because at a very early age, she's confused abuse and love. Um, so one of the ways that those types of um, the behaviour is uncovered and what's behind the behaviour is uncovered, because so much is forgotten um, of childhood abuse as a coping mechanism, is through dreams or dream analysis, or it's one way. So I had gone on that journey and I saw the deep value of dream analysis. Um, I've also been uh, on a Tibetan dream. So I, I'm trained in Tibetan Buddhist meditation and I'd been on a Tibetan lucid dreaming course as well. So I, I've always been very interested in dreams and I thought that dreams were quite a good way to gradually as a plot device uncover Lucy's trauma and also give a sense of foreboding and a hint to the reader about what's happening. They also allowed me to bring Carl Jung, Jung is in as a, a character, which I always liked the idea of. Um, so he's a character in the dreams. He shows up in Lucy's dreams to give her a message. Um, and I'll just, I'll read this quote if it's okay from the beginning of the novel, Ed, as a, to, to sh show you what the quote is. Um, Carl Jung said, when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside as fate. So Lucy gets this message from her dreams about the importance to make the unconscious conscious. So what's unconsciously driving her behavior is the journey she goes on to, to discover, to discover what's not seen. And that's mirrored in what's not seen in the graveyard that is Spain, that is Dea. So there's a sense of uncovering, uncovering, um, of the past in different contexts in the book. So the dreams helped with that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that that link to the unconscious, obviously, it's sort of, it's perhaps dealt with in, in a num number of ways throughout the novel. You know, we have, again, to try and avoid spoilers, I'm going to speak very carefully here. Uh, we have letters that are discovered that perhaps give us a hint as to unconscious thoughts or unconscious um, beliefs, perhaps from, from a past scenario. We have, of course, the sort of the therapy um, through line of the narrative, which talks us to us about the way we can encounter these unconscious elements of, of one's mind. And then, of course, the unconsciousness that we experience through a dream, through, you know, physically not being conscious and having those sort of play out within our heads. Um, I wondered actually if this might be a great time for your second reading. Now that the cynical amongst you might think that I deliberately led the conversation towards dreams knowing that this is what the second reading was about but I couldn't possibly confirm that. Um, so Sarah I wonder if you have a, a, perhaps a, give us an experience of, uh, of one of those dreams. Well I was going to do a dream Ed but I think I might read something else because <laughs> I've just changed my mind. That's absolutely fine. With with no segue whatsoever, uh, Sarah, would you like to just share with us your next reason? <laughs> um, I um, I need to find it. Um, 
I was going to read the letter of forgiveness because I think it gives an, a context for the Spanish Civil War aspect. Uh, and I now can't remember what chapter it was. It's quite near the end. But no, ah, here we go. I'll, um, I think I'll read the letter of forgiveness. July, 12th of July, 1987, Villa Rosa. To those I forgive, the others I forgave years ago. Nameless faces, disembodied members, they saw only a leftist widow, a leftist whore, the enemy. You, I have struggled to forgive. I have tried many times to write this letter, but failed. Today is my 87th birthday. A decade since the pact of forgetting silenced Spain. But the inside of a human mind is never silenced. Marta Alma Lobet, may your sweet soul rest in peace. I try to remember you prancing around the olive trees in the garden before the war, but I cannot push away the image of your face, a crushed paper ball of pain, hair pulled back and used like the reins of a horse as those men rate your sweet innocent soul one by one in the cellar that stormy night. It was a night when the Sirocco had blown in with such hot fury and those Saharan winds snatched away our screams for help and pleas for mercy. But who would have come? Who remained to hear them? They'd taken the men, they, Franco's men, and marched them to the Myriador. We knew what fate awaited them. We knew in the morning we would go with baskets like our neighbours had done to collect what was left of them on the rocks. I secretly wished that if we women made it through the night alive, that the sea would give their bodies a grave, so sick was I of the flesh. When they arrived, I'd been with my husband, Matteo Julio Nadal. The house was different then. What is now the library was an attic, and I told my daughter to hide there, shoot her up the ladder. We heard them in their truck past the, past the road by the house before they came down the lane. There was time to hide her. Up she went on her father's strong shoulders. Brave, they called him. Foolish, I said, when he refused to follow orders, spoke out against Franco's bidding. A hero, some still say now. But where did his loyalty lie? With his politics or protecting his wife and child? I was angry too with you for many years, my dear, darling, washed away husband. I forgive you. And although I raged at you for decades for speaking your truth, for standing up for all that is right in this godforsaken country, for fearlessly facing those young directionless fascist thugs at night, I would not respect you more than any man who has walked this earth if you had not. You spoke for me too, and for the millions too afraid to speak out against the Falang. I forgive you, my husband. May your soul rest in peace. For the peace of my own soul is why I write this letter. How my shoulders yearn for your strong arms around me, just once more, as I sit on the floor of this cellar. How is now a storage space for summer patio furniture, hats and the junk of our daughter's young family? You would love Miguel, thoughtful, just like you. This is my second attempt at this letter of forgiveness. The first time was the winter of 1977, just after the Pact of Forgetting was passed. Miguel was in his early 20s. He'd come down here into the cellar for something and disturbed me, but it was still too raw. Now the wound is old and calloused over. Now I have strength for it, dear, brave, foolish husband. I feel you by my side now, as I hold this pen steady in my aged hand. How cheated I feel that we did not watch the wrinkles etch deeper year on year in each other's faces. At least our daughter was spared. I could not have watched her as I was forced to watch Marta Alma Lobet, bless her soul. Here they come again, the tears. I thought there were none left. Maybe after I write this letter, the old wound will heal once and for all. They had their fill with us, drank what wine they found down here, stole what food we had left the winter, and drove off singing. He's Franco, Franco, Franco. We have a leader. The passages of honor we will deliver with no fear of adventure. The mandates of your voice, maker of our new history. He's Franco, Franco, Franco. That song, 
the light tone of their slurred words, like school children singing a Christmas carols, still wheels in my mind. At least your brother was not among them, although I might have forgiven him sooner had he not hidden behind his words and come to take you to the Myriador himself. Franco, I forgive him for unleashing this monstrous shadow over our country. Fascism is the shadow half of Spain's broken heart. The soul of our nation split, itself splitting souls as the war wheels rolled away from Villa Rosa. Marta and I did not dare move, for what seemed like a very long time. I see the exact spot there by the pipes of the old system. I remember the flick, flick, flick of a soldier's pocket knife in my right ear. I still hear it sometimes. Always in my right ear, when the Sirocco blows in from Africa. The pact of forgetting could not silence that. I thought he was going to slit my throat with it. When he was finished, I silently begged him to, as the next one took his place, and the next. I do not remember how many there were. Maybe the pact has started to do its work on my memory, but the flick of the knife in my ear, the pain on Marta's face as she scrunched up her eyes, her mouth as they pissed on her, and the rest. You should have gone into hiding held your tongue after your refusal to send those prisoners to Kamir for, to the firing squad. That sealed your fate. A soldier, no matter his military status, has no say. What difference that your brother condemned you a traitor? What difference? You should not have fought with words, my dear husband, for those who lack the skill of arming themselves with words will use cruder weapons. Marta and I paid for your clever rhetoric that night your appeal for leniency, for a fair trial for those men and women, your pleas for justice to General Franco and his baby-snatching doctors became our pleas for mercy. I forgive you, my husband, and I thank you. Maybe one day, when the people of Parma tell me that you were a brave man, I will not want to scream at them. In his bravery, he abandoned his wife and daughter to a lifetime of torture. For she may have escaped rape, but she suffered through me. Forgive me, my daughter, for every dark look and every harsh word. They were not aimed at you, but came from my own shame, my own hatred of those singing fascists. I forgive each one of you. As I sit here now, I force my heart to send you my rapist love. For that is the only thing I have found in this long, torturous life of mine that can dissolve the pain and the raging beast within me. And you, Juan Pablo Lobet, finally I come to you. You who knew me as well as my brothers, all rounded up in the night, all dead by them too. You who had laughed and played with us in the summers, who'd eaten at our table when the winters were harsh. You who I had kissed, just an innocent kiss, just once, beneath the two twisted olive trees, the lovers, followed by a giggle, we called them as children. You must have hated my husband when I returned with that rich, educated Palmer man. But could you not find it in your heart to be happy for me? I stared you in the eye afterwards and you kicked me in the stomach and told me never to look at you again. All these years I never have. All these years you passed through my land with your rake in your hand. Do you think I'm afraid of you, you little man? You killed me a very long time ago. It was only my daughter and now my grandson that gave me the will to live. Otherwise, I would have thrown myself off the myriad door onto the rocks like your sister Marta did and gone to a watery grave with my husband and my best friend. You took a piece of my soul and now I want it back. I forgive you, Juan Pablo Lobet, most of all, for it is you I have hated all these years and in doing so I have been diminished. I, Sofia and Valentina Nadal, forgive you for raping me and your sister that night in the cellar and again and again with your eyes every time you passed my house. There is no such thing as forgetting. I will not forget. I do not accept what you did as acceptable, even in war. It was evil. And I, Sofia Valentina Nadal, forgive you, Juan Pablo Lobet, because I will not go to my grave with this hatred in my heart. After all these years, I want peace more than I want revenge. I forgive the tears I was made to shed. I forgive the pain and the humiliation. I forgive the betrayal and the lies. I forgive the slander and the shroud of shame under which I was forced to walk the streets of Dea. 
I forgive the hatred and the torture. I forgive the violation of my home and the sense, my sense of safety. I forgive the punches and the beating, the branding and the raping. I forgive the terrorizing and emotional abuse that continues to this day every time you glare at me and rape me with your eyes and smile with that toothless smile of yours that opens my scar afresh again and again. I forgive the wretched dreams. I forgive the stillborn hope. I forgive the lust, envy and jealousy. I forgive the injustice carried out in the name of war. I forgive the cruelty and the aggression. I forgive the rage and the contempt. I forgive the world and its sins, for they are many. I forgive Spain, El Badre, for forsaking its people. I forgive the theft of my husband. I forgive the destruction of my friend. I forgive the loss of the sons and daughters I might have had. I forgive the theft of my soul, and today I take back what is mine. With these words, with the power of the truth of an individual soul, for an emotional truth resides inside me that no jury, historian, or God can deny, I forgive you. An, an excellent, excellent reading. Um, it very much brings me back to the, the way I felt when I read it myself for the first time. I just sort of sat there afterwards and closed the book for a second and just took a moment to sort of reflect on on what's been you know, what's been said in that letter. Um, I think that for me, the particularly powerful moment is that, that contrast between to forgive and to forget and the choice to do one and the explicit choice perhaps not to do the other, um, I think is incredibly an incredibly powerful moment in that, again, incredibly well-written letter. Um, I think it's, it's a very, very beautiful piece. Um, again, I, I have, I'm full of questions, um, but I think this would be a fantastic point to perhaps pivot uh, to, to those of you watching uh, in the audience. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question of, uh, of Sarah, then if you'd like to scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you should have a little reactions button, which will give you the option to raise your hand, um, after which I'll sort of call on you if you like, and, uh, and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, if you'd be more comfortable typing your question into the chat, uh, feel free to do that. And um, well, I'll sort of pose those questions to Sarah um, as, as they sort of they come in. Um, so do we have any questions? I've chosen this point as well, because there's always a lull, there's always a silence when you sort of people wait to ask their questions. And I think after a reading like that, a silence is perhaps an appropriate uh, moment to sort of to take there. Um, excellent, David, uh, good to see. Uh, I can see your hand is up. Yours is the first one that came through. Uh, what's your question? I really didn't want to be the first one, that's why I waited. <laughs> uh, Sarah, you mentioned writing about um, childhood trauma and my PhD novels are um, partly on childhood trauma too. I wondered what to you is the best fictional representation of that? The best fictional representation of childhood trauma? Um... I think that with the first that comes to mind is uh, Toni Morrison. I mean, not just one of her novels, there's several. Um, the way she does it is, uh, I think, a lot of it through the voice um, and the ly lyricism that she puts into her prose. I think is uh, astounding. The, the creation of the characters and the way in which it's uh she so she shows their backstory um so very well without too much exposition um and so you can see why they are the way they are and why they their behavior how their behavior is driven as you said by by their unconscious i think she's very very good at uh at, at writing trauma and and childhood trauma well i'm not a massive fan of and this is a generalization are those um, novels that are kind of, um, they call misery novels, you know? Um, I mean, there's lots of examples of them. You may have a different view, um, but I'm not, I'm not a fan of those, those sorts of novels that are kind of, uh, uh, some of them kind of romanticize. Um, it's kind of gratuitous um, misery. <laughs> um, uh, that it feels like wallowing. Um, some of those those misery novels. I don't want to name any because I don't want to insult anyone's books in, in particular. Um, but I, I would go to someone like Toni Morrison. What's That's yours? Right. Oh, I, um, I can't think on the spot. Okay, sorry. <laughs> but thank you. Question. I will reread Beloved. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. An excellent answer there, Sarah. Um, uh, Jonathan, I believe uh, your hand was up next. 
It was, yes. Um, Sarah, I was really intrigued uh, when you recounted your publisher's advice about dreams, because I'd never, I'd never thought about dreams in books before. But when you were talking about it, I was thinking, yeah, there is, there is often a problem with dreams in books, which is the, the kind of suspension of the normal rules. Often when you know it's a dream, you kind of care less about what goes on because it could kind of go in any direction. And I'm, I'm not saying you haven't succeeded because I, you know, I read the first few pages of your book today and it starts with a dream and it was great. And I was totally hooked. But I was just wondering whether you, with the, with the other kind of dreams in the book, whether you had methods of craft that you felt would make them more present and urgent in the reader's mind. Thanks, Jonathan. Um... Yes, I think, I mean, I haven't actually thought about this, so this isn't on the spot. Um, I think, number one, they need not to be too long, because exactly as you say, they subvert the usual rules. Um, number two, it needs to be clear that you're in a dream, I think. If you're not sure if you're in a dream or not, I mean, that might suit a certain novel, but it didn't suit this one. I think every novel's different, that's another thing. Um, I think the other thing is, like anything, question oneself why is this dream here what's the function of the dream in the plot is it taking the plot forward is it showing more about the character um because if it's not performing a plot function i consider cutting it these dreams ideally hopefully are taking us deeper into the characterization of the character of the of lucy they're lucy's dreams showing how she's been uh, her, her, showing her shadow so it's showing her unconscious self to the reader and they're also taking forward the plot as well because she's learning from her dreams and there's analysis going on in the dreams and then we've got Carl Jung giving her messages through the dreams um, that she's then taking into her therapist and also learning from herself so I think it does depend on the novel um, but I think as with the world of any novel, the dreams, you need to build the world and be consistent about it. The way in which you build the world of the dreams in a novel, they need, you need to be clear with the reader what the rules are and then be consistent about the dream world rules as well. Very interesting. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question there, Jonathan. Thank you for an excellent answer there, Sarah. Um, Mahaba, I believe uh, your question was next. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much. That was absolutely mesmerizing. I loved your reading and I love your writing. Um, my question is, um, I know you answered that. And when Ed asked you that question earlier, how did you navigate through the fictional characters that you were writing about and your own real life pers personality? I think that must have been really intense to navigate through these two worlds yeah I mean I think thanks Mahaba and so great to see you here um <clears throat> I think that in any novel I think um I mean I know that you're a writer too so um I think that for any writer if you're deep in a novel you find yourself a bit schizophrenic and in another world as well I mean I actually think you know maybe writers are all schizophrenic and it's just so we don't get taken away by the men in white coats that we call ourselves novelists but you you really do find yourself when you're deep in a novel especially the drafting of it I find where you're discovering what happens I never know exactly what's going to happen in a novel and partly I write it to find out it's exciting for me um as it unfolds um and uh I was I do walk around as my characters so I do become a little bit Lucy and a little bit Miguel. And I'm wondering how would Miguel ask for a coffee? How would Lucy ask for a coffee? And when I'm in Cafe Nero and things like that. So I do partly, partially walk around when I'm deep in the drafting phase of a novel um, in a bit of a different universe. Um, and uh, I, I sometimes have to find it difficult to switch and uh, switch out of that universe and switch into another one, into the real world. Sometimes I want to stay there. In, this, in the case of this novel, sometimes I just wanted to get the hell out of Dea. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. 
Excellent. Thank you, Mahabha. And thank you, Sarah, for the great answer. Uh, Mike, I believe you're next. Hi there. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on the, the novel, Sarah. It's absolutely wonderful for anyone who's not a chance to read it yet. It's, it's really uh, utterly exceptional. And what, one of the many um, amazing things about it, I think, is how you're able to um, have the themes of personal crisis and trauma and societal crisis and trauma. And they're just interweaved so cleverly and coherently. Um, and I and I wondered if you had had any thoughts on the, the similarities and differences between how we experience and heal from individual trauma and how societies experience and heal from collective trauma. Wow, Mike, th thank you. I'm glad you like the book, which I'm, I'm, I'm hugely um, flattered because Mike, um, D.D. Johnston, you can look him up, is an amazing novelist. So it's a huge, huge uh, compliment. Um, and one of his books, The Deconstruction of Professor Thrub, go and buy it. It's one of my favourite novels. Um, and so I could ask you the same question, Mike, because <laughs> you, you look at this yourself. And I, I don't, I think, so there's two parts to that question. One, the, the interweaving of the personal trauma and the collective trauma, I think that's partly done through language. So in the language that I'm using, I'm very aware of echoing, uh, in this particular example, Spain and the Spanish Civil War and the language of torture. Um, and then I picked it, I particular references that are really quite specific. So for example, the exchange of sugar, which had become a luxury commodity and that was exchanged um, for sex between the, the soldiers would pay in sugar for women uh, to have sex with them. And so I, I have a repetitive allusion to sugar and Miguel is quite often adding sugar. He's obsessed with sugar. He's adding it to everything and the baking of the cakes and this obsession with sugar. So there's this echoing of the Spanish Civil War through these very specific black market products that was used as a, a weapon of degradation. Um, in the novel. So that's one example. And there's a number of them whereby I'm, I'm creating layering in, a, in that specific way. The healing uh, from any form of trauma, I think, is a, is a tough one. I think that creativity in writing, writing about it and, and, and um, breaking the silence is part of it. So with this novel, although it's fiction and I could have easily hidden behind it, um, I decided in the dedication to dedicate this book to abused children and the adults that we become. And that we was a big decision for me because on the one hand, I wanted to stay hidden behind being a fiction writer and it's most certainly fiction. It's a long way from my story. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to break the silence of childhood abuse because I think that's one of the things that perpetuates it, the shame and the pain that, that is, is keeping people in silence. So I made the decision to uh, break the silence and I think that was actually quite healing for me on a personal level. Um, to write this book was quite healing. To sit here now is healing. I wonder why I chose the letter of forgiveness. I think that was also healing to read that in front of an audience. Um, and I think that by writing the book, I've also broken the silence of something that still hangs over Spain, which is the pact of forgetting. I've, I've maybe contributed in some tiny, tiny, tiny indirect way um, to the trauma that the silencing and, and uh, the, the, for people who don't know, the pact of forgetting is um, the name of the amnesty law, one of the laws that um, meant that none of the crimes against humanity could be take, brought to justice that were committed under General Franco and uh, during the Spanish Civil War. So, uh, you know, there's still a lot of trauma around that. And I think that's a journey that Spain has to go on. So I'd like to think that in some small way, this novel has moved a tiny step forward in breaking that silence. Amazing, wonderful, thank you very much. Thanks, Mike.
Excellent. Thank you, Mike. And thank, thank you again, sir, for an excellent answer. We've got uh, two more um, questions that have appeared in the chat, uh, which I will offer for you uh, now, Sarah. So this one's from Matt M. Uh, it says, uh, thank you for sharing your book, Sarah. And as everyone said, your readings are really powerful. Um, I had a cheeky two-part question. Uh, firstly, you mentioned that this book took about six years to write. Do you have any tips on how to keep going and finish a manuscript? And secondly, could you speak to your journey on getting published? Did your PhD act as a springboard? Sure. Um, so in terms of keeping going, um, a novel is a long journey, it's a quest, you are the knight or the heroine in shining armour or bling, um, whichever, and you need to put on your armour and your bling every day and keep keep at it. Sometimes it's not possible every day, it's good to put a book down for a while and go back to it with fresh eyes, um, we all have other lives too, but I think if you have enough passion, it's passion and commitment and stamina that keeps you going with a novel and if you believe in a novel enough you're going to be riddled with doubt but there is something if you if there's something within you that believes in the novel keep going back to that place and I find when a novel wants to be written there's something that keeps pushing me back to the blank page um, and this was this novel was one that was calling me so so it's sometimes a very quiet voice, Matt, um, but just show up at the blank page again and again and again. And sometimes you might write, I don't know what to write, I don't know what to write, but just keep writing, I don't know what to write, and eventually something will show up on the page. Um, and the second part of the question, um, Barbican Press is an amazing press. Barbican Press uh, was partly, I think, uh, uh, the brainchild of Martin because he he found himself reading a lot of PhD manuscripts that were brilliantly written but that would never see the light of day in a commercial publishing house and so publishing uh, these these novels became very important to Martin which I'm very grateful for the PhD was definitely part of the springboard for me publishing um, a novel and uh, it's amazing to be with a publishing house that believes so vehemently in their novels um, and is um, is so passionate about the sort of writing that, that very often wouldn't get picked up by a commercial publisher. Um, I didn't want to write vanilla um, and sometimes that's easier to get published. So uh, yes, it was definitely part of me, not just publishing, but publishing what I wanted to write and what I truly believe some readers want to read. No, excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Matt, for a fantastic question. Um, so I'm very aware of the time. We've got two other questions that have just sort of slipped through in the chat. So I think we've just got time to answer both of those and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a session. Um, so this one's from Katharina, uh, Sarah. It says, Dear Sarah, my copy will arrive tomorrow and I can't wait to devour it. Uh, I was wondering if you had any tips on how to stop yourself from being too blunt when writing about brackets personal trauma. Uh, I find myself overdoing it sometimes because I relive these moments when I'm writing about them and it's hard to be subtle. Yeah, good question. Um, thank you, Katharina. Um, I would say when you write these trauma pieces, first do something really important. Become your character. Be the character and write it and know, make sure you know and understand the character's trauma well enough. Even if uh, it is a character that's very close to who you are. And I think they're the most difficult characters to write. The, the characters that are kind of similar to us um, because there's things about ourselves that we sometimes can't see it's very often easier to write a character that's really very different to us um, so become your character know your character's trauma the background to the trauma and write it through the voice of your character not your voice through the voice of your character I hope that helps Excellent. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you for the question. Uh, and then our final question, and this is from Damon, I think it's a great question to, sort of, to perhaps end on. Uh, what's next? Um, well, um, at the moment, my next um, thing I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to be reading Mike, who asked a question earlier, is novel Disneyland, because that comes out in two weeks. Um, I'm, uh, that's my next thing to do for this evening after this. I've been looking forward to it, um, which is an amazing novel. I nearly finished. Um, in terms of my writing, not my reading, because reading is important for writing. Um, 
I'm writing a number of novels. The sequel to my adult fairy tale, Sophia's Tale, which is called The Shadow Knight. Uh, it's going to be a trilogy, and this is the second book. That's in the drafting. There's also in the research um, arena, um, The Goldsmith of Girona, um, which is based during the Spanish Inquisition in Girona, um, when Jewish people were given the option of either exile, convert to Christianity or death. Um, and I've actually, part of my research, this is how much I do my research, this ring has been made the way the jeweler would have made a 15th century gold ring. Um, so I've learned and become a jeweler in order to do my, my research. Um, and I'm also writing, I've finished, I'm just editing my first nonfiction book, which is called The Soul Writer's Way. And I developed a method, uh, you can look at drsarahwalton.com to see my method. I've When I had a brain injury and can no longer write, I developed a method of writing from the intuition. And I've written a nonfiction book with some exercises for writers, um, a how to do it guide. So three things there. Excellent. So we won't be wanting uh, for the next one then to come out uh, in the very near future. Um, well, excellent. Thank you so much uh, for all your wonderful answers there. And thank you very much for sharing uh, the Silk Pavilion with us. Oh, I blurred my background. This is a terrible idea. Um, hopefully, as if by magic, in just a moment, the link to this book is going to appear in the chat for this uh, for this uh, event. So you can all, if you haven't bought it already, go and navigate yourselves there and, uh, and enjoy the text. So thank you very much, Sarah, for sharing the work with us and for your readings and your answers today. Um, thank you, everyone, very much for your time coming. Um, I'm just going to hold this up um, to encourage you all very firmly yeah. to make sure you buy the novel. Look, look him in the eye <laughs> and tell me you don't want to buy this book. Um, so thank you all very much for the conversation. Uh, thank you all for being here rather for the conversation. Thanks again, uh, Sarah, for your work and for the book. Thank you. It's been fantastic to talk to you about it and uh, I hope to see you at the next one.